Regarded as the Wayne Gretzky of women's hockey, Angela James blazed her own trail as the first black woman in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Known for her gritty style of play, she set records in multiple leagues and tournaments such as the International Ice Hockey Federation, Ontario Colleges Athletic Association, and many more. She was the Canadian national team's first and only openly gay black captain. Now, as an assistant coach for the Toronto Six in the Premier Hockey Federation, she continues to pave the way for the next generation. Marion Ajay Jamara is the Management Development Associate for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Marion works alongside front office staff learning and contributing to projects in areas such as business relations, hockey operations, scouting, media relations, and player development. Prior to joining the Maple Leafs, Marion worked in sport management and marketing for over five years for organizations such as Commonwealth Sport Canada, Ringette Ontario, and the Black Coaches Association. She also completed a master's in sport management at Western University and her bachelor's degree in political science at the University of Waterloo. Angela, I am so excited to have you joining me today for a really interesting and exciting conversation. We're gonna be talking about hockey, we're gonna be talking about culture, Black History Month. I am pumped to chat with you. I can't wait. Uh, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to this great conversation. The two of us kind of sit in a unique position as black women who kind of sit in this space, who are in the hockey space. So I, I'm wondering, as a black woman who has played hockey, what has the locker room been like for you? I really, when I get up in the morning, you know, I, I'm not looking at myself as, hey, you know, I'm black and I'm going to play hockey today. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking at uh, myself that I'm getting ready to go play hockey. And then when I'm in the dressing room, I look around the room, I'm looking at them. There may not just be all white people, but predominantly over the years it has been. Um, but now, you know, we, there's Asian, there's uh, Indian. For me, as time went on, it wasn't a big deal. When I was younger, sitting in the dressing room, being a person of color. I always got looked at, but I never thought it was because of my color. Mm. I always thought it was because I was a girl. <laughs> and nine times out of 10, it really was. It was because I was a girl. Not until you get on the ice and then there's competition, does uh, what you uh, look like really matter because you're competitive, they're competitive. And the only thing that they could ever lash out to at you isn't about your ability, but it was about the color of your skin. I, I have had the opportunity to work in, in the locker room uh, with the women's hockey team before. I have seen a bit of a unique side of things. I think women's hockey is very communal. Like we're all focused on camaraderie, especially when you're all part of the same team. So I've definitely felt that positive aspect of things. And then working in the front office, I've been welcomed with open arms. Everybody's been super encouraging and really inclusive. But I think sometimes what I've noticed is that people that don't exist within those bubbles, but still exist within the hockey space, oftentimes don't really understand who I am as a person at my very being. And like you mentioned, they, they see the color of my skin and sometimes have criticisms and things to say, but I think the encouraging thing has been knowing that I'm a part of a community or have coworkers who will always have my back, always kind of want to stick up for me and make sure that I feel as included as possible, so. Well, that's the hockey world, right? No difference whether you're a player or whether you're in the front office yeah. at uh, your teammates, they're teammates mm -hmm. and, they, and they have your back, right? And the ones that don't, um, you'll find out really quickly. For the most part, especially now today, people aren't afraid to call people out. And I think that's important. The side banters, the, the backroom coffee, jokes, you know, those kinds of things. And I think those are, are slowly getting corrected. Now they are replaced by other jokes. It might be somebody's gender, it might be something else. And you as a, as a person of color, knowing how that is throughout the year, then have to go stick up for the little guy yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and understand that, hey, you know what? I was there once. You've made a really interesting comment and point about, I guess, advocacy. And we've talked, again, throughout your whole career of playing experience, obviously you didn't always have teammates that looked like you, but at what point did you feel like you had a responsibility to be an advocate to actually talk about the realities of racism, of any biases that might actually exist within the sport? I grew up uh, in a white family, so I would get picked on a little bit here and there, but uh, you know, my, my sisters and my brothers, I was the youngest of five, they had, they had my back, so anything that was said to me, they're in trouble. And if they couldn't handle it, then I had to handle it mm -hmm. on my own. As years went on, 
on. I was fortunate enough to uh, be inducted into the Black Sport Hall of Fame in Halifax. And it wasn't really until I went to Halifax and uh, listened to the award winners and the history of uh, black athletes and understanding what, you know, why Cito Gaston is a two-time world champion and can't get a job and looking around and seeing that it really opened up my eyes and make me see that hey there's there's more here than the just the playground and the and the backyard and and my environment that uh, there really is some some issues that are going on from that point on um, you know I tried to educate myself a little bit more and open my ears and listen and really listen and, and pay attention uh, you know I feel that it's my responsibility um, I can't do everything but I still have a responsibility to um, you know create a, a positive environment out there Thank you so much for taking action and serving as a light for so many of us in, in this community. And then you actually work with the Toronto Six. What does it feel like now seeing girls like Sarah Nurse and Soraya Tinker and Michaela just out there on the ice playing the game and knowing how much they mean to so many other little girls and little boys who, who kind of look up to them? What does it mean seeing those kind of players? Yeah, uh, you know what, it's wonderful and uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough to uh, have talked to all of those girls and, and they're wonderful people. And, and you know, they have a way better understanding now um, coming through the system and, and also understanding, you know, that they're role models to the young girls. And I was fortunate enough to uh, just have a conversation with Soraya Tinker, knew that she was involved with the uh, all girls uh, black uh, hockey and that she was bringing a, a chapter over. And I was mm -hmm. just asking, I was just getting to know people, right? And she said, yes, I'm doing this here in Canada and I said oh I said you know my daughter she has two sons how about you know you you bring her along and sure enough picked up the phone had a had in minutes had um, a little uh, event over at the the uh, the dream rink uh, in Avenue Road there and she went there and my daughter was just amazed that there were so many other black uh, young girls playing hockey fit right in same hair same ponytail same body mm -hmm. types that was just so much of an eye-opening for her and when we got home she couldn't think me enough for um, getting her involved in, in that and I think that's important that um, these young athletes uh, have conversations. That's amazing. It, it, it's awesome to know that the athletes that exist now today are going to have a bit of a different experience and are also going to provide a different experience for the next generation coming up. Like you mentioned, Black Girl Hockey Club is doing amazing things in the community. Asking them ways in which we can kind of make the sport better has been a bit of a game changer for me. I think it's kind of changed my perspective as well, but it also makes me think how how sometimes all it takes is seeing one person that looks like you or has had similar experiences as you to kind of really want to make a difference. My parents actually immigrated here from Ghana, which is located in West Africa in the 80s. And, you know, growing up, like we were into soccer, we were into basketball. It doesn't snow where they're from, so nobody was really ever thinking about hockey. And it was funny, the other day, my dad sent me a text message. Um, he was like, he's watching the Leafs game, go Leafs go. And to me, that was a very defining moment because if I was not a part of the space, if I wasn't working here, would that be something that my dad was ever interested in? And so to me, that's it's been, again, life changing and, and really awesome to kind of just see. But with that being said, thinking about how we are constantly looking for ways to kind of develop and grow the game, what type of ways uh, would you encourage us to kind of continue to promote diversity within the hockey space? To create diversity uh, within hockey space, you know, in my opinion, really has to start at the grassroots. I really think that through education, educating the coaches, uh, the referees, the parents, to understand that things are happening out on the ice, in competition, in the stands. Racism and understanding and acceptance and all of those things, it really does come from the home. Yeah. And if we can't get to the homes, then it's a vicious circle. It's like living in the projects, mm -hmm. you know, like my family, you know, like they keep living in the projects, right. they never get out. And sometimes we have to break the cycles and there's lots of cycles that need to be broken. I think that 
uh, again, mentorships, uh, education. And I know that people are getting tired of, oh, it's black, it's black, it's black, it's black, it's black. Well, you know what, it's all right. It's all right mm -hmm. to, to get tired of it because sooner or later it's gonna get a change and we won't have to do these things because it should stop. Whether it's black or whether it's uh, people's sexuality, people's preference, whether they feel that they um, identify differently or of a different nationality. It shouldn't really matter where the human race and so the sooner that we can accept and stop that at that level out uh, the better off would be programs are in place you know like I think you you do it softly and you do it um, um, smartly it's not going to be a change that's going to be overnight at the end of the day when they're looking at you they're looking at you that you're you're black mm -hmm. and uh, that's sometimes all they can see mm -hmm. you know they don't know that uh, anything about you they don't know that possibly that you were born here in Canada or you've been skating on the ice for 30 years right. they, they certainly don't know that and they probably don't know you I think one of the things that I've loved about working here in particular is how intentional the Leafs have been, uh, bringing on people like Mark Frazier, um, and then even creating wonderful programs uh, like the management development program and the coaching development program to allow uh, racialized people to get a taste of and be a part of this space and contribute to this space. With that being said, it's a reminder that, like you mentioned, whether it's at a grassroots level, whether it's your kid's coach, whether it's a teacher at school, whether it's the people that run the facilities or the provincial sport organizations or even the professional leagues. Everybody needs to be super intentional about wanting to create diverse spaces. And Okay, how do I get people who visibly look different to be a part of this space? How are you finding people that come from a variety of different walks of length that contribute to this one space to make it better? And I think that's kind of how we have to, we have to look at hockey, we have to look at sport. And I think to like want to expand and diversify any type of like thing that you're a part of, you're also increasing your, your player base. Right. Let's sustain the league as long as we can. How do we do that? By making sure that we tap into a variety of groups to, to access as much talent as possible. So Everybody's starting to be accountable for their actions and, and the past actions and, and future actions. So people are learning right now. There's a huge learning curve. When I look at the, the Toronto Raptors, I think of Toronto. When I look at the Toronto Maple Leafs, I think very corporate. And I hope the Leafs with yourself and, and Mark as well and, and a number of other initiatives that are taking place that uh, we change the culture well I think it's already started you can see in the stands not that there's been a lot of fans this year <laughs> but um, we bring the culture back uh, yeah. into the stands yeah. the, the city of Toronto yeah. um, because it's not the same as in the 1960s um, we've evolved Sometimes change may feel slow, but it's coming. And I know we've talked a lot about diversity and representation in this space, and we were kidding a little bit earlier that you check off a whole bunch of boxes. Yeah, yeah. How do you often feel sometimes, I guess, being at the intersect of so many different spaces? A female uh, playing in a predominantly male sport. Um, back in the day, you know, I'm, I'm coaching now. A black woman, a gay woman, a mother of children. There's a, a, lot, a lot there, um, but you know, Living in Toronto, I, I honestly have to tell you that, you know, I, I'm very comfortable for mm -hmm. who I am and I probably could have um, experienced a lot of prejudices, not that I haven't in all of those areas of my life. When you are outside that box and not in the, in the norm, you know that you are possibly going to have those kinds yeah. of situations and uh, you have to deal with them. I'm from a mixed family, so I've I dealt with it my whole life. Sometimes I used to uh, hear it from the black people that, you know, you're not black enough. And then I'd hear from the white people, you're not white enough, so what are you? I just think that uh, with now and our culture the way it is and the, the mixed races and we have nowhere to go but up here. Like, look at we've got... Uh, uh, Punjabi, uh, NHL, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got leagues out there that people probably don't even know yeah. exist. Just fun leagues, um, beginner leagues um, for different nationalities, all black leagues. Um, 
There's been Jewish leagues for years yeah. and years and years and years and stuff. I think one of my favorite things that you mentioned there is that it's only up from here, right? This conversation really gives me so much hope about what the future of hockey really ought to look like and where we're going as a sport and as a culture and as an organization. Well, Angela, I really enjoyed our conversation today. I think so much of what you shared has really given me hope for the future of hockey and for even the hockey that we're experiencing now, not just the sport, but our community. Uh, I really enjoyed again talking to you and I appreciate your time and thank you so much for joining me. Well, good luck with uh, Toronto and, uh, you know, if you have hope, there's nothing that can stop you mm -hmm. there and uh, I know that um, you can't go down from here. Yeah, only up only from here. Only go up. <laughs>